Hi, welcome to Some of Your Parts Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Betsy Greenleaf, premier pelvic health expert and women's wellness warrior. Join me as we discuss women's wellness topics and discuss tips and tricks with top elite health experts and where you'll discover that you're greater than the sum of your parts. And don't forget to like and follow this podcast and the YouTube videos so that I can keep bringing you great information. Also, follow me on Instagram at Dr. Betsy Greenleaf. Cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer worldwide, with 99% being linked to the virus, human papillomavirus. On today's show, we'll be talking with Dr. Donnie Wilson, an expert in human papillomavirus, cervical dysplasia, and cervical cancer. Dr. Donnie is a naturopathic doctor, professional midwife, clinical nutritionist, best-selling award-winning author, researcher, natural products formulator, and a mother practicing in the New York tri-state area. She's helped thousands of men, women, and children find solutions to their most puzzling health issues. She uses the latest advances in naturopathic medicine, lab testing, and investigative techniques to uncover the root cause of illness and craft individual programs that guide the body back to health. She's a recognized expert on stress-related illness and specialized in helping patients address and overcome autoimmune diseases such as Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, Crohn's, rheumatoid arthritis, genetic mutations such as MTHFR, hormone imbalance, sleep and mood-related issues, leaky gut, and women's health, fertility, and especially, like we mentioned, cervical dysplasia and HPV. I'm excited to be welcoming best-selling and award-winning author, Dr. Donnie, as we discuss HPV and cervical cancer. Thank you so much, Donnie, for being with us. Oh, of course. This is so, so awesome. Thank you for having me. You know, it's really interesting because we hear a lot about HPV, but even I think even as gynecologists, you know, I'm dealing with it with my patients, but I don't think we really in traditional medicine have a really good understanding. And, you know, when I think back on on facts that I know, you know, I remember when I first started getting pap smears, nobody even talked about HPV. That wasn't even a thing that you talked they, about. They weren't connecting it back for a long time. And then I remember as I went through training, they were saying that 80% of college-aged women have are positive for HPV. It's a lot. So tell me, first of all, what does HPV stand for? Well, human papillomavirus, we say it as if it's one thing, but there's actually over a hundred HPV viruses. And so you start to realize, like like you're saying, if 80% of people would test positive, it's really in our environment. It's um, It's something that most all of us will have had at some point in our lives. So it's not a rare virus. It's a very common virus. And it's actually more than one type of virus. Some types of HPV cause genital warts. And some types of HPV have the ability to cause abnormal cells or cancer, both in women and in men. And, you know, we know the association with the abnormal pap smears. And I know that when patients get their pap smears or they test positive for HPV, the first question people ask, well, first of all, they always ask, well, where did I get it? Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. and then the second question they ask is, how do I get rid of it? And that's what I want to pick your brain about, because <laughs> in traditional medicine, we don't have great answers. We just tell them like, oh, maybe your immune system will handle it. We don't know if it goes away. It might stay there. It might not. We don't really know. And that's about as far as I can get in traditional medicine. So no, it's, it's, I mean, and thank you for being so upfront about it because I speak to women around the world every day I get contacted. And a lot of times they're hearing, you know, kind of like this mysterious message. And sometimes it comes with a message of shame 
or, you know, being hard on themselves about getting this virus and what it means in their life and in their relationship and for their future, maybe future pregnancies or, you know, future of their own health. And so it's a very, it can be very stressful and anxiety producing for women to find out that they have HPV, whether there's abnormal cells or not. And so I just like to acknowledge that, you know, that how great to be able to work with, you know, a doctor like you who who's going to say, hey, I acknowledge that we don't know a lot. And in conventional medicine, it's not that there's a pharmaceutical you can prescribe for HPV. It's not like you can say, oh, just take this pill and it's going to go away. It, it doesn't exist. Yeah. So no wonder you're in that situation with your patients where you're like, well, we can do a leap procedure if there's abnormal cells, which is going to remove the abnormal cells, but it doesn't remove the virus. So the virus can cause abnormal cells again. And, and that's the other thing I hear from women is over and over, they get a leap, then a year or two later, abnormal cells again, they have to have another leap. And the issue is that these leap procedures over time can damage the cervix. Um, so women who are wanting to conceive or have a future pregnancy, they start to worry about the health of their cervix and if that could in you know, affect their fertility, which is a real concern, right? Especially if they're, if the cells advance and there's more abnormal cells in the cervix, they might need to get a cone biopsy or even a hysterectomy, which, you know, can definitely affect um, reproduction and ability, it, right? Yeah. And it's interesting because they've even changed some of the recommendations on the pap smears. Like I remember when, we, when I trained, it was like, all right, as soon as you start having sex, you should start getting a pap smear. Or, you know, if you were like kind of a teenager and now they're like, well, no, you shouldn't even start until you're after 21 because in traditional medicine, the idea is, well, there were so many like abnormalities found in the cells from Tons of different things could be viruses, mm -hmm. could be just the fact you're growing, and then we were taking action on these abnormal findings without it need you know need to to do that. So well, and that's the thing is, I think it gets very confusing for practitioners. Um, as a naturopathic doctor and a midwife, I'm also trained to do Pap smears and have been in that situation with patients too, where you're you know the, all the time they're changing their parameters. You know, oh, in this situation, you can wait a few years before doing a Pap again, and then you know, and a lot of times women are very confused. You know, and who really wants to get a Pap anyway? It's yeah. like, why do we have to do this? So. To understand that the PAP is looking for abnormalities of the cells on the cervix and also the vaginal wall, if we test that. And so it's the, the virus has been associated with causing those abnormal cells. And we can luckily catch it before it becomes cancer. So what we're really looking for is kind of these preliminary before cancer abnormalities in the cell. And we give them different names. That's the thing. The naming all changes all the time too. I know it's hard to keep track. <laughs> it could be either um, what we call ASCUS, which is just like very low inflammation, which, which like you said, can be even caused just from um, having a, like a yeast or vaginal infection. It can be caused. I see it a lot of times in peri or postmenopausal women who have low estrogen, sometimes they'll get a little inflammation on the cervix and then become, I think, more predisposed to HPV activating again. So anytime, you know, now we know, I don't know if you've seen this recent research on the bacteria vaginally, you know, when we have this healthy microbiome vaginally, yeah. it protects us from things like HPV. And when that microbiome gets disrupted, whether from stress or spermicides or other treatments for vaginal infections and so many different causes, then we become susceptible to HPV. And so with the pap smear, it's gonna show, you know, some gradation of abnormality, either mild like inflammation or what we call CIN1, 2, 3, which all are before it becomes in situ cells, which are these precancer cells. So we have in some ways, I think of it as a good thing. It perhaps gives us a chance to catch it and do something about it before it becomes cancer. Because for men, there's no test 
Men most times don't have any symptoms unless they have genital warts. They don't know they have HPV until it causes oral or rectal or penile cancer. So in some ways, at least we have this pap smear to help us identify it early so we can do something about it. And make sure your doctor tests for HPV because when you do a pap smear, that's a separate test, right? We have to check off separately. We have to say, check for the pap and check for the HPV <laughs> and make sure your doctor checks for HPV because sometimes they don't still. And I'd rather know. I'd rather know yeah. if HPV shows positive um, because t from my perspective, there is something we can do about it. And you know, that's the other thing I've always has confused me about how somebody will come back positive for HPV and the next time you check them and it's gone. And then there's the other person who it's there and it's there and it's there and it's there and you just keep finding it and you're finding it and they're like, well, what now? And we're like, oh, we just keep following it, you know, so... And it's stressful because women then fall, go along for many years of their life with this thing kind of hanging in the background, hoping it doesn't cause abnormal cells, wondering if it's ever going to leave them alone. You know, it's uh, it's like you just wanted to just you want to just shake it off and get rid of it. And it's um, the thing is, that one way I think about it that I think is really clarifying is that in only 10% of cases, does it cause abnormal cells? So if we think about it as like you're describing, like most people are in the 90% where your body just, your immune system figures out how to fend it off and it goes away or goes dormant and it doesn't show up again, or maybe it shows up later, but it never causes a problem. That's a 90%. So you kind of are hoping, you're like, I'm hope I want to be in the, we want everyone to be in the 90%. <laughs> but for those in the 10%, why is it? You know, they're like, why am I in this 10% where it's causing abnormal cells? And to me, the answer comes back to thinking about it from the perspective of stress. Yes. Because what I consistently find is that women who have abnormal cells and even women who have a positive HPV, if I say to them, has there been stress recently in your life? They always say, yes, there's been a relationship stress. Maybe they they had a divorce. Maybe they had a, a move across the country or change in a job or death in the family or all of the above in one year. And that emotional stress definitely lowers our immune function. And when our immune functions down, we become susceptible to all viruses, not just HPV, but HPV is one of those viruses that it's just waiting for us to be stressed. You know, it's just sitting there going, cause we all, it's all around, right? We all have this HPV in our, really in our environment. It's just waiting for that chance when you're susceptible and it's like, boom, I'm there, you know, and it's gonna start causing trouble. So it's, it part, part of it is emotional stress, but I also would say it's stress in the form of toxins. We know that mm. HPV and abnormal cells are more common in women who are exposed to cigarette smoke. Um, we also know it's more common when women are on a birth control pill, which is a form of a chemical that's shifting our internal environment. Um, so if you think about it in terms of toxins as a stress, I also see a connection to diet when women have a diet that's more of a stressful inflammatory diet. And I see a lot of connection between gluten, for example, and abnormal cells on the cervix. And when we can identify the gluten sensitivity and other food sensitivities, and I help them recover from gluten sensitivity and, and the digestive, the leaky gut issues that are associated with that, the cervix health improves. So it's Thinking about stress, emotional stress, but also stress in these from these other ways that it shows up for us in our lives. Um, um, there's more I can say too, but if you know what I mean, just to start thinking, why am I in this 10%? Well, it's likely there's something that's been depleting your body and your immune system and allowing this virus to now do its thing. I mean, that's just what that virus does. So if, if it has its chance, it's gonna do that. So it try to shift it from because I think a lot of women feel very overwhelmed and disempowered and uh, as a victim of this virus or a victim to having been exposed to this virus. But I really like to help try to shift that mindset and say, actually, this virus is teaching you that 
something is overwhelming your system. And yes, right now it's the virus that's showing up, but it could also have been autoimmunity or even, you know, other cancer cells or, you know, like this virus is teaching you that it some your body needs you to take care of it. It needs more help recovering from stress and some diet changes and maybe getting more sleep and decreasing your sugar intake. And the better you take care of yourself, this virus is not going to have a chance to cause trouble anymore. You know, that's such a good point. And you think about for many women, we're, our lives are just like on the go, on the go. We're not sleeping. We're stressed, whether it's like we're mom trying to figure out what's going on with the kids or we're got a careers so and we're trying to figure out what's going on with that. And then you're grabbing the quick meals. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it's the stress has got to be an epidemic in itself. It's exactly right. And this is just one little message from your body saying, I'm overwhelmed in here. I need some help. So when somebody comes to you and they've been diagnosed with HPV, what what steps do you start with them? I start with this kind of conversation of really helping them to shift their mindset and go and get to a place of feeling in action about it, feeling empowered and knowing that they can um, we the body can grow new healthy cells on the cervix, so we can we can do that. We you know if we give your body the right tools and nutrients and support, it can grow new healthy cells on the cervix, and your immune system can protect you from this virus. Um, so once you have that knowledge, then we go through a process of looking at the diet and potentially doing a food sensitivity panel so we can see exactly which foods and what degree of leaky gut is present so we can address it. I also recommend testing for cortisol levels and adrenaline levels because those are our main stress messengers in our body. And so if we know stress is the underlying cause, we're going to want to know how stress is affecting your body in particular. Now, everybody says to me, well, we're all stressed. Of course, my cortisol is off. Yes, but when we do this test, it it makes it so we can treat it specifically. Some everyone responds slightly differently to stress actually. Some people their cortisol goes high at different times a day, sometimes their cortisol goes low at different times a day. Sometimes adrenaline goes high, sometimes adrenaline goes low. So I find it makes a difference to know exactly what's happening in your body. So then I can use different herbs and nutrients to address that. It's going to be different herbs that decrease cortisol that's too high than the herbs that increase cortisol that's too low. So we want to know specifically. So you do testing. I also do testing for just your health in general. We want to look at nutrient deficiencies. Is there an iron deficiency? I also do a lot of work with um, this gene called MTHFR, which is highly associated with abnormal pap smears because... Here's the thing is MTHFR, it sounds like a mouthful, but it really is just about folate and B9, vitamin B9. The thing is, is that about 40 to 50% of us, me included, have a gene variation where our bodies don't convert folic acid into folate, which is the active form very well. And when that's the case, we don't have that active folate for our body to use and our body uses active folate to make healthy cells. So how are we gonna make healthy cells on the cervix if we don't have enough of this active folate? It's like, it makes so much sense, right? So we're like, okay. And the studies show that, like the studies show that when, when women get more folate, specifically methylfolate, especially if a woman has an MTHFR gene variation, the cervix heals <laughs> and the rest of the body does better too. But, you know, like we need that methylfolate. So I, we can test for MTHFR for women who are curious, but I essentially assume that I'm going to use the active form of folate for all of my patients and recommend that. And so you want to look at your multivitamin or your prenatal or any B complex you're taking and make sure it says methyl folate, not folic acid, because you you might not actually be able to use that folic acid 
to benefit your health. So you need that methylfolate form. Yeah, then you're just buying these vitamins and you're just wasting your money because it's not even being converted in your body. It's not converting. And then you're and then you're like, well, why do I have this abnormal pap smear? Well, because we, your body needs those nutrients to do the right job. So we can also do testing like in blood work, we can look at something called homocysteine and we can look at, I also look at methylmalonic acid to understand the B12, which is also important. And so these blood tests, which you can do from a regular lab, if you're, you know, not, it's just the doctors don't often order them, right? So you have to kind of know and ask for, hey, I want to know my homocysteine. I want to know my methylmalonic acid. I want to know my vitamin Z, my ferritin, you know, like, let's find out what these levels are, because then we can use those nutrients to help your body, you know, fend off this virus and recover. Now, And I love like all these things to do for the body, but you know, if somebody's doing all these things and they're still not dealing with the stress, they're not going to get anywhere. So, mm -hmm. you know, and I know people deal with stress in different ways, but do you have any favorite like techniques that you tell your patients on how to deal with stress? Yeah. You mean like even in the moment? (laughs) <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was just doing, I've just been completing a heart math certification. So that's the thing that just popped in my head because um, heart math is a form of, it's kind of like, to me, it's kind of like a meditation or even along the lines of like a mindfulness or imagery um, where you just take a moment to literally just take a few deep breaths. Like sometimes I think we think it's supposed to be more complicated than that, right? (laughs) Like stress feels so overwhelming. It seems like it needs an equally difficult counterbalance. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) You know what I mean? But actually, just if you take a couple deep breaths, like right now, if you just breathe in for five seconds and breathe out for five seconds, what we're doing is we're sending a signal to what's called the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the anti-stress part of our nervous system, the relaxing part that signals to our vagus nerve, to our digestion, but it also signals to the ovaries to make healthy estrogen and progesterone, which also is related to abnormal PAPs. And it signals to you know, just the nervous system overall to calm down. And so simply stopping and taking a couple deep breaths with heart math, what they do is they actually measure your heart rate variability, which you can, you can get these little things you stick on your finger, or you can use like a, um, like an aura ring or a Fitbit and you measure your, what's called heart rate variability. We usually think of our heart rate as just like you know, the same thing all the time, but actually there's this slight variability that's a good thing. Like you want to have a little bit of variability in your heart rate. And that actually shows that you're responding well and recovering from stress well. If you have a, a lower heart rate variability, it indicates high stress, overwhelm stress state, or like us being in a sympathetic fight or flight all the time state. So using heart rate variability and these devices you can track, and then you can practice, like you can take a couple deep breaths and kind of see in front of you, oh, did my heart rate variability improve? And so it gives you that immediate feedback that what I'm doing is making a difference. And it's amazing. Like I've, I've been, uh, uh, you know, I've loved meditation and different forms of mindfulness for many years, but the nice thing about heart rate variability is that it can give you something you can look at and really get that information right away and say, wow, taking a couple deep breaths, whether it's like you say, well, maybe every hour I'm going to try to stop and take a couple deep breaths or when I feel overwhelmed, you know, when I'm, when that's, when, you know, you've got five things that need your attention all at once and you can just go, oh, let me take a couple deep breaths. Literally that can be an immediate reset for your stress system. That's a great, those are great suggestions because I know sometimes it's hard to even, like we're always on the go, a lot of us, and just trying to take that time. So mm-hmm. it really you know, is. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure, you know, you got to put patients who's stressed already, and then you get, they get told that they have HPV. And I'm sure that adds to the stress. It does. 
Absolutely. So then, and like a lot of health issues, you know, then you have the stress of the health issue adding on top of it. And it can feel like it's just a snowball of stress. You know, you're like, how do I just get off of this hamster wheel here? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, to me, it's, um, this is where I've been, I've written a couple books about stress and I'm working on another one. And I, because I really feel that what can make a difference is understanding that stress response and understanding that part of being human is that we're going to be stressed. We're not going to, the goal is not to try to eliminate all the stress. I mean, yes, we can, we can try to kind of make our schedule as best we can and communicate as best we can, but to be human is to be stressed and we actually need stress. One of my favorite analogies is birth actually that when they study women in labor um if they don't have enough cortisol and adrenaline labor doesn't happen but if they have too much cortisol and adrenaline labor doesn't happen either Mm. so women need just the right amount of cortisol and adrenaline for the body to get the right signals for labor to happen and that's just a microcosm of our whole life we need certain amount of stress, you know, to enjoy ourselves and have challenges and be inspired and so on. So it's not about trying to eliminate all the stress and it's not about trying to get your cortisol and adrenaline to zero. That wouldn't be good. Then you'd be doing nothing, you know? So it's about just kind of like embracing it and realizing that, okay, it's human to have stress. We actually have a built-in stress response system for that reason. But the more we understand our stress response system and the more we understand our individual ways that our body responds to stress, we each have, it's almost like a fingerprint is what I find that we're, we have such an individual way based on our genetics and based on our past stress exposure, that's gonna determine, does your cortisol go too high in the morning or is it too high in the middle of the day or at night? Is your is your adrenaline too high or too low? And then as you learn that about your body, you can take steps to prevent it, to keep it on track. And that's why with the patients I work with, because I've been helping women with HPV and abnormal pap smears for over 20 years. And what I find is that when they go through my protocol, where we, we address the HPV directly and the abnormal cells, but I also teach them how to recover from stress and be resilient to stress, those women don't come back to me again with HPV, not 10 years later, not 15 years later. They're not come, they, because they've learned their body, they've learned what to eat and what to do when they're stressed, they, that virus doesn't have a chance to come back and their immune system knows how to protect them now. That is great. You know, um, if, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you would like us to know about HPV? Well, um, one thing just to, cause I know a lot of women ask me about, you know, specific herbs and nutrients about for HPV and there definitely, there's, there's so much research and you can, you can learn so much about this, um, um, on the internet. And I also have a, um, a guide. I'm happy to share with your listeners this, um, this free guide I created that talks about, the most common nutrients and herbs we use to again, basically ad- directly go after the virus. Like vitamin C, for example, we know vitamin C supports our immune system. We oftentimes are just using it even for a cold virus, but we can use vitamin C to help protect us from HPV virus. Um, and then it can go from there. We talked a little bit about folate, but there's also, uh, for example, vitamin A, which is a Uh, another nutrient that's good for our immune system and also acts as an antiviral. Um, Now, some of these, this is where it can be helpful to work with someone who's a naturopathic doctor or clinical nutritionist or a practitioner who really understands how to use these nutrients because there are safe ways to use clinical doses of, say, vitamin A to help your body fend off this virus without going into a toxicity of vitamin A. So you want to get the right doses, but we can also use vitamin A vaginally, like as a vaginal suppository. Oh, wow. As a direct antiviral. It's cool, right? That is really neat. Yeah. So it's like, when you think about it, like, I know, I think all gynecologists would be like, 
give me it. Give me some of that. You know, yeah. I'll put in some vitamin A vaginally and we can use herbs that are antiviral. Green tea, for example, is shown to help reverse the dysplasia, but is also antiviral. So you can drink green tea. You can take capsules of extracts of green tea and we can use green tea vaginally as a way to help fend off this virus. So it's kind of cool and fun when you start to think about it that way. Like we can use substances from nature, nutrients, herbs that help our body do what it's trying to do anyway. It's trying to protect us from this virus and we can use it in a systematic way to help protect, you know, help get these abnormal cells to go away, help the virus go away. And then you don't have to keep on taking those doses forever. You use them for a period of time until the PAP comes back to negative and the HPV to negative. And then we go more to a maintenance protocol with the supplements. Um, but it's, yeah, to just think. And, and then also using this concept I mentioned related to optimizing the bacteria, both the bacteria in the digestion and the bacteria mm -hmm. vaginally. So they're going to protect you over time and really learning, hey, this is my body. I know I'm going to be exposed to viruses. I know I'm going to be exposed to stress. So what can I do on a daily basis to help protect it? And that's how I would, how I look at it. That's how, why I think the protocol is so successful is because it's, it's teaching women, you know, I wish we came with instruction manuals a lot yeah. of times, I say. <laughs> no, right? I, I hear you. I know, it's crazy. Oh, but that's but, so exciting. And you know, sometimes I wish, like, oh, there's many times that I wish that I went to naturopathic school instead of regu regular medical school because I really, I'm like, this is so fascinating to me. My husband would kill me if I went back to school again now because <laughs> I'm like, well, you're talking and I'm thinking, I want to go back to natu I'm going back to school, go to naturopathic school. I want to learn all this stuff. I'm like, this is just so interesting to me. It so. is. And it's, it's really life-changing for women. And this is what drives me to want to share this message is when, when women come back to me and they're like, I got my pap back. I got my colposcopy back and it's all negative and normal. Thank you so much. I'm so happy. And, and I just feel so happy for them because they feel empowered and now they've learned what their body needs. And it's just so rewarding. And they say to me, please, Dr. Donnie, teach more women, tell women this is possible because it's not, it's not out there. It's, it's, you know, it's not well known that this is possible. And, and thank, so thank you for, for sharing this message. This is awesome. Thank you so much for being with us. Where can people find more information about you? Well, they can find me on my website. It's, it's Dr. Donnie. Donnie is D-O-N-I. So it's you could either do D-R-D-O-N-I or D-O-C-T-O-R-D-O-N-I.com, where I do have a lot of blog posts and, and podcasts and and um and so on. And um yeah, I'd love to hear from anyone. And I'm happy to do like if someone's listening and they have HPV or an abnormal pap smear and they want to just get on the call with me for a couple of minutes, I'd be happy to do that because I know how stressful and overwhelming it is. And it's a it's a big decision. You know, what am I going to do in this moment that feels best for me? And so to be able to if it helps to talk it through with me and just say, OK, what makes sense in your situation for your next step? I'm happy to do that. That is awesome. Thank you so much, Donnie. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Take a look at our show notes. We'll have a special link to Dr. Donnie's Say Goodbye to HPV course. Today's episode was brought to you by the Pelvic Floor Store, your resource for personal health. You can visit the Pelvic Floor Store at www.pelvicfloorstore.com. For more information about Dr. Betsy and her other episodes, you can visit drbetsygreenleaf.com. Don't forget to like and follow this podcast and also our YouTube videos. Also look for Dr. Betsy Greenleaf on social media. And don't forget that you're greater than the sum of your parts.